So the point is not just to continue to worship the guru. The point is to use the guru to become all the things, right? To achieve self-realization, to achieve enlightenment. Sri Gurudev wasn't giving us these teachings so that we could just, you know, remain disciples of his and, and just live our life, right? No, that wasn't the point. The point was self-realization. And so I think like, you know, that's why he says like, don't just keep worshiping the ladder, climb the ladder already. Like go there yourself. Don't just sit here on the ground and be like, Oh, ladder, you're so great. No, climb up, get to the enlightenment yourself. Don't just like, Mm -hmm. you know, think it's not possible for you. It's possible for every single one of us, every one of us. Yeah, so I think it's just so interesting, Radha, like considering the way that you grew up living in Yogaville, yogic family, it's so unique. You know, most of us, our childhoods were were not like that at all. So I'd love to just hear about if you could share your story a little bit and uh, how you got to where you are right now. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, many people probably listening to the podcast know of my parents, Bhagavan and Bhavani Metro. Um, I am the fourth child of the six of us. Um, and it was a great actually position to be in, in our family because my parents got involved in meditation early on, like in the late sixties and became vegetarian before I was born. So by the time I came into the family, they were already vegetarian. They were already meditating and doing these practices. So that first year of my life, um, was already really steeped in my parents being involved in the practices. And then we met Sri Gurudev when I was about one year old. And, um, the, (laughs) you know, Sri Gurudev, like almost immediately, you know, I, one of the first stories of us being with my, him with my family and meeting the kids in the family is, um, he told my mom, like, these aren't your kids. These are my children. Like, you know, <laughs> these are, they belong to me. And so don't, don't think anything else. And pretty much with Sri Gurudev, that was always like our relationship was like, um, you know, so many people in our organization take on Sanskrit names and, um, Sri Gurudev, I was already named Radha. My parents were involved in the Hare Krishna temple at one point before we got involved with integral yoga. And so my parents named me Radha. Um, so Sri Gurudev, when I was born, I, or when I was young, I had all this hair. So I had these cute little pigtails. Um, and if you, if you are following me on Facebook or you're friends with me on Facebook, you can go and I just changed my profile picture to the cutest little picture of me with these pigtails sitting on Sri Gurudev's lap. And so he started calling me bunny because I guess my little pigtails look like little bunny ears to him. And so very from the very, very beginning, like I always had a really unique relationship with him. He called me bunny until the very end of our, um, physical friendship. And, um, so yeah, so my parents, uh, really became very heavily involved in integral yoga when I was young. Um, and then when it came to be time for me to be school age, they decided that they wanted their children to go to yoga school. So they picked us up from Colorado we had been involved in the institutes and stuff there and Sri Gurudev had been to my grandparents' home and we certainly had a close relationship every time he came there. But then they picked us up and moved us to Connecticut where we had the integral yoga school in Connecticut. So I am actually the only person to have gone from first grade all the way through high school and graduated from the Yogaville schooling program, uh, which is pretty amazing and pretty unique. Um, I always say like, you couldn't dig integral yoga out of me if you tried, like Mm -hmm. if those really early years are what really like create your, um, your sense of who you are and your belief systems and all of that, like, there's no way you're ever going to get integral yoga out of my belief system because it's so ingrained in me. So I had this opportunity, right. To go to school, um, at the yoga school in Connecticut, which was a magical experience, absolutely magical. Uh, we're just like little kids, like running around this beautiful property in Connecticut and Sri Gurudev would just be like driving along and just stop and throw us into his golf cart and just drive us around. And, um, he would come to visit us at the school. And I think what was so exciting at that time was like the school was just beginning and there was such an energy of, um, excitement and creativity, right? Like we were doing something so important in the world, right? Like 
we had this incredible guru and he'd just come from India and he was teaching us these teachings. So now we're looking at like, you know, mid seventies and he'd only been here for like 10 years. So the energy was still so vibrant of like, it's building everything. And so as a kid getting to grow up in that energy was like super, super powerful. Like everything was fun, right? Grit, it was always fun. He was like, you know, he was, every time we saw him, it was fun. We were all just like climbing all over him and hugging him. And, and, um, So, yeah, so getting to be in that environment. And then, of course, with the school, the school was this experimental school to see, like, can we create a yoga school in the United States? And at that time, I might be wrong, but um, I think the only other school that was doing something like that in the United States at that time, as far as being a yoga ashram, was Ananda Ashram. Because at that time, Yogi Bhajan was still sending his students to India, right? So everybody growing up in Kundalini Yoga was going to India. So um, Ananda was the only other place that had a school like that. Um, So yeah, so we were like in this unique environment where we were, you know, I started meditating every day at the age of six and was doing the Hatha Yoga practices. But even more importantly, and something we've been laughing about hysterically over the last couple of days with my family is uh, we started studying the Mahabharata and the Ramayana very young. So I don't know if you've read the Mahabharata, Abhi, but it's quite <laughs> quite an interesting story. And we were just laughing, being like, as kids, we were being exposed to like these, these wild stories of like Indian gods who were like chopping off heads of demons. Or, like, you know, <laughs> um, I was just reading a great one the other day of, you know, uh, Amba, who was one of the goddesses and, And, uh, and, you know, through this whole, whole series of events, she ends up going up into the forest and she wants to become a great warrior. So she goes into the forest and meditates and comes out a man. And I said, you know, it's no wonder that like yoga kids are just like with the way things are today. We're just like, you know, whatever. So, you know, you can be a woman, you can be born as a woman and be a man later on or, you know, whatever that experience is for us. But Um, the other thing is, is we got to study all of the major religions and the major texts. And then of course the branches of integral yoga very deeply. And what would happen is we would start off like at six and they would just give us the basics. Like we learn like Yoda Chitta Vritti Narodaha or something like that. And then as we went along, um, throughout school each year or, you know, every couple of years, our study would get deeper and deeper. So by the time I actually graduated from the yoga field of Yalium, then I was a fully certified yoga teacher and then immediately went on. And I actually um, was one of that group of first people who were certified in Raj yoga in our organization. So um, it's, you know, all that by 18, like by 18, I had already, um, and this is 1990, right? So really early on in this yoga world to have had that experience. And again, so unique in the sense that, um, with our, our organization, really my peers, um, of my age group are, there's only like three or four of us, maybe five of us, um, who had a similar experience to me, although none of them actually continued from first grade all the way through high school. Um, but there's just, there's a handful of us. And then of course we also went through Dharma confirmation, which there's only, I think five people in our entire organization that were given Dharma confirmation by Sri Gurudev, where, it was really a dedication of ourselves to this path of yoga and the path of integral yoga, where he um, he gave us the Gayatri mantra and uh, initiated us sort of into this path of service to integral yoga. So it's a really, really incredible, unique upbringing. And of course, there's six children in my family. My parents are ministers. And, you know, like I said, it, you, you can't take yoga out of my story because there's if you took the yoga out, there's nothing left. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so basically I worked at Yogaville, I guess is bringing you kind of up to where I am now, because now I'm the executive director of the New York Institute. Um, so, yeah, I worked at different positions in, in Yogaville. Um, again, I had a very close relationship with Sri Gurudev through, uh, through my teens and adulthood. Um, and again, like if you look at my pictures of my life growing up, like so many of them are with him and... Uh, so many of my my significant moments growing up are surrounding him. So after he left the body, then I did take on some roles um, in Yogaville um, and then went through some pretty hard struggles. One thing that I don't know that everybody knows about me is I worked on Wall Street in 2000, 2001. 
and I was uh, actually standing a block away from the World Trade Center when the first building fell. And so definitely some of the last teachings that Sri Guru had really left me with really strongly was around that event. He came, we actually came home right afterwards. And uh, one day he came and he spent literally hours on the couch, just sitting there holding my hand and holding my little sister Pona's hand. Really, um, I really just feel like infusing us with the energy to be able to get through that experience. Um, but it caused a lot of darkness in my life later on. And so definitely like, it's not like, this yogic path is always easy. We all have our karma. And that was some pretty big karma for me. And so, um, you know, uh, going into lots of anxiety and depression and things like that. But for me, what's been so powerful is that I'm always brought back to the yoga. I'm always brought back to the teachings and I'm always brought back to how the teachings are the most powerful teachings out there. So it was actually through um, through doing mindfulness practices, through dialectical behavioral therapy, right? In in um, therapy practices that actually brought me back around to like, wait, I know this stuff, right? I know this. I know the teachings. Um, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, they're not just this theoretical book. They are practical advice. They're like science of how to get yourself through these moments and through these experiences and come out on the other end and really thrive. So, um, you know, I always like to presence that because sometimes people see me and they're like, Rada, you're so smiley. You're so joyful. Like, you know, you really just look like you've got your act together. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I am. And, um, there's also, you know, I definitely have gone through some pretty heavy, heavy experiences in my life that have caused me a lot of pain and suffering. And I always, you know, get to go back to the tools of yoga to get me through them. And particularly for me, it's integral yoga, right? Like I really, um, I went and spent about six months in India at one point and got to meet so many yoga masters. And of course I grew up meeting dignitaries. There's maybe not a single dignitary yoga teacher famous person who's come through yoga real, right. Or through integral yoga that I haven't had the opportunity to meet and probably be even performed for. We performed all the time when we were young for dignitaries. All the people I've ever met in my entire life, none of them ever compared to being in the presence of sugar enough. None of the teachings I've ever been exposed to from other teachers or other readings have ever to me compared to the teachings of sugar enough. So for me, it always comes back to these teachings. It always comes back to integral yoga and it always comes back to just how beautiful this person is and was not only as a human being, but as a guru to me, like he was such a pristine, beautiful soul. Like just to be in his presence was awe inspiring, absolutely awe inspiring. So that's kind of like all over the place of my story, Avi. So you can ask me questions or <laughs> yeah, I'm sure so, I skipped over many years there somewhere. <laughs> there's there's so much there. It's beautiful. So Thank much. you for sharing. You know, this last part that you talk about Sri Gurudev and his uniqueness and his place in your heart. And I'm curious if you have any particular insights in into his path and maybe anything that he shared with you uh, on his journey that mm. Mm, allowed him to, to become the person that he was? That's such a great question, Avi. And I'm kind of thinking like, you know, it was less like the teachings are less about, less about the lessons that he would, he would tell us because it's so interesting. My generation, um, my parents' generation have all these stories of Sri Gurdav, all these quote unquote lessons he taught them. Right. And if you talk to people who are around my age, we, we often are like, did Sugar have teach? Like, can you remember lessons he taught us? And there's very rarely that I actually remember like opportunities where he taught us lessons about things. But for me, it was like really in his way of being. And of course, that way of being, right, was a little bit, I think, is who he is, who he was raised by, his parents right? His um, experiences, his spiritual teachers, but also just who he was, right? Because at the essence of all of this, um, 
I met this amazing um, yogi. He was he was really interesting in India. We went to his ashram, and I want to say his name was Yogi Raj Sarat Kumar. And he was this great yoga teacher, and people flocked to him, and they did kirtans. And I just remember, like, he was sitting there in a... <laughs> in a chair. There was like this big, like, I want to say it was like a statue of him, but he was sitting in a chair and he was sitting there smoking a cigarette. Right. And I was thinking, you know, when you're at the level of the, the, the guru, it doesn't matter. None of the stuff matters, right. Whether you're smoking cigarettes or doing whatever you're doing at the level of the guru, it doesn't matter. At our level that we're at now, those things do matter, right. Doing the practices, doing the sadhana, doing all the things do matter. So in a way, it's like Sri Gurudev did all of these practices, all this sadhana, all of this stuff. But then when he became the guru, he also became the example for us, right? So, so much of it was like, um, you know, if you ever saw him, he was always so beautifully, immaculately dressed, which partially was probably because he had really great um, support. Like people, you know, uh, I know that some, he had beautiful women who would like sew some, some clothes for him but like his nails were always beautifully trimmed and his hair was always beautifully combed and like um you know there was no like traveling mendicant energy around him he was always so beautiful and so um pristine and so in my own life I like always look to like sometimes less what he was telling us and more who he was being for us and how can we be that for other people right how can we how can we create that energy and how can we create that love and joy um, that he brought with him every single day? Because if I can bring, I'm so like all over the place. I'm sorry. I'm totally not answering your question. Um, But I was just thinking, you know, if I can be, if I can bring the joy that he brought, even like a smidgen of the joy that he brought every day to all of us, then I am doing far more for his legacy or for, Um, bringing the greatness of him out into this world than if I'm meditating 50 hours a day or if I'm, you know, the best Hatha yoga teacher in the whole world or, you know, and I'm not trying to knock those things. I'm just saying like, as far as what he taught us. And I can only say like Avi on his path, he must've done a lot, a lot of sadhana, right. To get to the point where he was and to be able to carry that energy because I know as I, as I'm trying to carry the joy and the kindness and the compassion, right. Everywhere that I go with me, it requires a lot of practice on my part to be able to do that, um, to maintain my equilibrium in these, you know, and, uh, especially my position now, which has a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, every day something's being thrown at me, right? There's some kind of crisis. There's something happening every single moment of every day. And so I'm always thinking like, not maybe even what Sri Gurdjieff's words were in a given moment, but who is he being? Like, how is he being? How is he being with me? And that's what I can judge. How is he always being with me? Right. And that's what I, I can try to create when I'm interacting with people. So what I'm kind of hearing you say is that, you know, the, most important thing perhaps was just the way he was as a person and that that is maybe a lesson that you've taken that uh hmm, that's really about the internal work it's about changing myself from the inside out not what qualifications i have or labels or what someone else sees like no like the actual person that i am you know and it feels like it's almost like a foreign concept in a way in our, in our culture these days to, to do that. And what does it take to do that? Right. Like, so I'm like considering that it, it takes a lot of courage, right. And a lot of interest in, in truth and, and growth to look inside myself and see what's going on in here. And can I be honest with myself mm-hmm. and see maybe the ways that I'm not so that, maybe that's not the best way to say it, see the ways where maybe I can make improvements and then have the courage to take that leap and make those changes. Because it's like doing the same thing again and again, the way that I've always done, like that's comfortable. Yeah. And it's so uncomfortable to try to change myself or like, what does it take to actually like 
do that, right? <laughs> yeah, right? And so this is what I would say is like, not only did he give us like his way of being, right? Which actually comes through in his photos, it comes through in his videos. But what he did give us was he gave us these incredible teachings, right? So um, when you read the books, right? Which I do regularly now because it's almost like my lifeline. Like I got, I get to be in remembrance every day. And that's part of my practice right now is just have his voice constantly in my ears, listening to the mantras, reading his books. But every time I read the books, I'm like, he, he gave it all to us. He told us everything we need to know about how to live a joyful, peaceful, easeful, useful life. And it's all right there in these books. Right. And every single time I read them, something new jumps out at me or I have developed to a point, right. Where I get new wisdom out of his words. And for me, that's exciting because I've been studying his words since I was six. So what am I seeing now as an adult, as a 50 year old woman, as opposed to when I was, you know, they were reading his words to us when we were six. And what am I now getting from the same teachings and, you know, I mean, it's incredible because he doesn't have that many books. It's not like Swami Shivananda where we have to read hundreds of books. He's only got like four or five that we put together. Right. But like, it's amazing to me every single time I read them that I get more insight and depth and also like the awareness of like, he gave it all to us. It's just a matter of whether I'm willing to receive it. Am I willing to receive it? Cause it's all there. Sometimes I read stuff and he says, it, I don't want to hear it. Right. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to hear that part, right? I'll just do my own thing for a while. And then I go back to it and I go, oh man, if I just listened to that part, that would have made my life probably a little easier, mm. right? But it's all there. And so I love that because it is really about our own inner process, but he's given us the guidance. Like he always said, like, I'm the ladder, right? Don't worship the ladder. I'm the ladder, right? But use the ladder. The, you, the ladder is useful. You need the ladder to be able to climb up. But don't get stuck on the ladder, like become that yourself, become all of the teachings, become what you saw in me. And so I think that's really powerful is and to me, that is the greatest way that we honor him is that we become, you know, these beautiful light beings um, to honor him and his teachings. Is that in a way like him saying, like, don't make it about me, like make it about the teachings. Like I am, I am just the vessel that, that, that takes you there. Is that what he's saying? So I would say yes and no. So yes, that is what he was saying. And it is about the teachings. However, one thing that I think is good to clarify, especially in this day and age, is that there is great power in having a guru, right? So yes, you can get there of your own accord. And there are many, many, um, many yoga teachers, particularly, I think I was just even reading something from Master Shivananda, who's kind of like, yeah, without a guru, you're not getting there, Right. But Sri Gurudev wasn't like that. He was like, you know, if you, if a guru resonates with you or you find a guru that resonates with you, then, then commit yourself to that guru because the guru can get you there faster, right? Because you're actually like, have like this, um, you know, the mantra almost becomes like this, uh, this, um, like cord or something like an energy that like connects you straight into the guru and the guru can then like move through the processes and move you along faster than if you were just doing it on your own. You can certainly read the teachings and get there, but you are never going to get there as fast and as powerfully like the guru disciple relationship to me is the most powerful relationship um, ever. And I have, you know, I've got some great relationships in my life. I've got great parents. I've got a great husband, but the guru disciple relationship there's just nothing like that. And I didn't believe that. So an interesting story. I didn't really believe that when I was younger. I always said to Gurita, like in my teen years, I was like, I don't need mantra initiation. I know who my guru is. I'm connected to him. And then when I wanted to move up to New York City the first time when I was 18 years old, Sri Gurita said uh, there were two main conditions that he made to my parents. And it was like, okay, she's 18. She can move to New York and go to school. But these are the two conditions. One she has to take mantra initiation. She said, he said this to me. He didn't say it to my parents. I'm sorry. One, you have to take mantra initiation. Two, you have to call me every single week. So every single week I would have to call Sri Gurudev. I say have to, because as a teenager, 18 years old, all grown up and living in New York city, it felt a little bit like I have to. Um, and of course, back then we didn't have cell phones. So I would go down into the basement of the school 
the, where I was going to school and I would have to get on the payphone and call him collect on the payphone. And so like, I'd make this little collect call and his secretary would, you know, answer and I'd be like, it's Rada calling for Gerda. <laughs> Will you accept the charges? <laughs> <laughs> but the, I think the point that I was making was that is as close as my relationship was with Shrikarinov. As much as he knew, even at that moment, like up until then, um, by the time I was 18, like we, like he knew how much I loved him and I knew how much he loved me. But even then, in order to go on this next part of my journey, he said, you need to commit yourself to the guru disciple relationship. It's not just enough for us to have this incredible you know, love for each other and for you to be like my, my baby. And, you know, instead I need you to like commit yourself to this mantra. And so, um, sure enough, doing that, um, taking mantra initiation was so powerful. And that mantra, it has saved me in more circumstances than I can even begin to, to count. Like those moments where life seems so difficult or trying and, uh, I was struggling so much. Uh, the mantra is what really carried me forward. And sometimes I use the mantra just, I, I say it's like a little mind scrubber, right? It's like a little thing going in and scrubbing all the negativity out of my mind. If I'm like, woo, I feel really negative today. I'll just say the mantra and it acts like a little scrubber, right? Where I feel like I'm scrubbing everything out. Um, so yes. So I think it's a both and. Yes, you can absolutely say he is not the point. So the point is not just to continue to worship the guru. The point is to use the guru to become all the things, right? To achieve self-realization, to achieve enlightenment. Sri Gurudev wasn't giving us these teachings so that we could just, you know, remain disciples of his and, and just live our life, right? No, that wasn't the point. The point was self-realization. And so I think like, you know, that's why he says, like, don't just keep worshiping the ladder, climb the ladder already, like go there mm. yourself. Don't just sit here on the ground and be like, oh, ladder, you're so great. No, climb up, get to the enlightenment yourself. Don't just like, mm. you know, think it's not possible for you. It's possible for every single one of us, every one of us. But, but also maybe you really respect the ladder and the fact that the ladder is allowing you to ascend um, for sure. Right. Just don't don't stop at the ladder. Right. And so sometimes like, right, without, so the guru becomes the ladder, right? You Let's just say, let's just, let's just take this metaphor a little way. <laughs> so let's just say there's a really tall wall and you got a ladder, right? It's going to be a whole, a heck of a lot easier to get to the tall top of that wall with a ladder. If you don't have the ladder, yeah, you'll probably figure out a way to get up the wall. It's probably going to take you way longer, right? It's going to be a lot more frustrating or you make it so frustrated. You just give up and say, forget it whatever. I'm not, it's not even worth getting to the top of the wall. This is too hard. Whereas those of us who have a guru were like, Oh, guess what? We got a ladder. Look how easy it was. I mean, easy. Look how easy it was for us to, <laughs> to get to the top of the wall. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say this path is, path is exactly easy, but <laughs> another question I want to ask you around this is like, how would you define what a guru is? Because, oh. you know, like at the end of, uh, I think it's beyond words, you know, Gurudev writes like, um, you know, if I, something along the lines of, if I've offended you at all, like, please forgive me, I'm a human being, you know, and that really stood out to me like, oh, okay. Like, you know, so it, is a guru an example of like the highest level of what a human being can be, or is a guru something different from a human Oh gosh, this is such a good conversation. Like such a great question because it also has like a lot of levels to it. Right. So the literal like word means remover of darkness. So you could say anyone who's removing your darkness is a guru for you. Right. If we're talking about it in those terms and many people talk about their own teachers as a guru. And I see this term thrown around a lot of like, so-and-so is my guru. So-and-so is my guru. So-and-so is my guru. That is not the relationship that we are talking about when we're talking about that level of guru-disciple relationship. So when you're talking about that particular relationship, and I do have the great benefit, like many of us, to have had a very um, human relationship with Sri Gurudev, right? He literally was like my grandfather. 
that there is no doubt at all. Like I had more interactions with him than I did with my own grandfather. So I had this human side where he was human, right? And he had these human experiences and he'd do human things with us. Um, and you see the humanness in him, even in the sense of like, I remember, um, mother's day just happened. And I remember we were at one luncheon and they were talking about his mother and, you know, they would read stories about his mom and he had tears, right. That were kind of streaming down his cheeks as he was missing his mother. So that's the humanness, right? So yes, as long as he's in this form, he's going to have human emotions, human things going on. Now, what's so amazing about the guru or the person, I should say, okay, now let's separate it out because not everybody who achieves self-realization wants to become a guru. Not everybody who achieves enlightenment is going to become a guru of others. So when you've achieved a state of enlightenment, right, you are free from the sense of like the constraints of this human bondage, right? So like you and me, we might be like, woke up this morning, I was in a really good mood, then I stubbed my toe getting out of bed, and then my mood was bad. Right. And then I went around the rest of my day kind of being in a bad mood because I was like, ow, my toe hurts. Now, the enlightened master is no longer bothered by that because they see that none of that's real. Right. So they wake up in the morning and they're in a great mood. And even if the mind is doing a thing like I stub my toe and the mind's like, ah, that bed, I stub my toe. There's just like no attachment to it. Right. It's just gone. And they're just ready to stay in this state of equanimity and peace and joy. Now, the guru is the one who says, I have achieved this state and I am here to help others also achieve this state. Because there's many people who can achieve enlightenment and just go off and do whatever they're doing. And they have no interest in bringing along others with them. Because also the other side of the guru disciple relationship is that it's much more complicated, right? You've got people worshiping you. You've got people having expectations of you. You've got all of this stuff. And you have to be a pretty, like, you know, you really have to be grounded in that enlightenment. And you have to really be an enlightened guru, right? In order to be able to weather all of that stuff. Because people are throwing riches at you and, you know, worshiping you and bowing down to you and all of those things. And you can't let the, any of that energy like interfere with your equanimity. So the people who are actually able to be like, yes, I am willing to be the guru. I'm willing to have this relationship and, and, and be the ladder for you. Right. Already are like a little bit different than the ones who are just achieving enlightenment. And then in the case of our guru, in so many ways, like he was so generous and so kind and so gentle and so sweet. And don't get me wrong. He was fierce. Sometimes we all got to see him in his fierceness, but he would just say like, my fierceness is like taking anger out of the pocket and putting it back. And I'm utilizing this because you chose to have this relationship with me. He's not just going around on the streets, like yelling at random people. No, he's saying you chose to have this guru relationship with me. And therefore I am going to be the one to like point out the areas that you get to rub and scrub the places where you get to improve upon yourself in order to do that. So, you know, I think it's like this really multi-leveled thing, but I would say when you really commit yourself to a guru, it is like the most committed, powerful relationship that you will ever have. If you do it right, right. Far more powerful than your relationship, even with your spouse or your parents or your siblings because it's really about, um, it's about remembering the purpose of us being on this planet and allowing this person or this energy, because I would say even, you know, after sugar, I've left the body. Is he not my guru anymore? No, he said, actually, I can, I can be even more powerful, right? Once I leave the body, I can serve you even better and I can um, guide you even better. I keep wanting to say Rada. He never once called me Rada. I can guide you even better, Bunny. <laughs> he always called you Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> he always called me Bunny. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I can guide you even better, Bunny. And that's what he would say. He'd say, I'm closer than your own heart now, but once I leave this body, like there's no restrictions anymore of this human form. And I can just be ever with you. I can literally just be in the very mm-hmm. cells of your being. And so, you know, in the sense of, the loss of his physical form was so great as the loss of my grandfather and that attachment to that physical form. But I lost nothing when it comes to my guru, 
because my relationship with my guru feels even stronger than it ever had before. And certainly, you know, um, when you get to be in direct service of him, like I am now, it feels even better. It's really beautiful to, to experience him in my heart and really in my life and, and really feeling him so strongly right now. Mm -hmm. So have you noticed like a, a change in yourself since you've uh, decided to become the executive director of New York? Like, has that um, kind of expanded your relationship with it, with him? Have you noticed that? Yeah. So I lean into him a lot right now, obviously, because I, I get to, because it's not about me, right? None of this is about me. It's about how can I serve him and how can I be the best conduit for his teachings and his vision that he put in my heart, right? So um, I think each of us has different relationships with him. Maybe he gave us different information, but all I can do is judge what his and I relationship was. Again, I can pick up the books and I can, this is to know yourself. I can look at the books and see my interpretation, but also I just get to know what he, the vision he gave me for integral yoga and what the vision was moving forward. And so, um, yeah, but less even than noticing it in myself, because to me, it's almost like, uh, that's always been there. It just kind of waves and comes in waves and, and sometimes it's stronger and sometimes it's not, but my husband has noticed. So he said, mm -hmm. I really like notice a huge change in you because I see, um, how you've like come alive and how you really feel much more joyful and connected and, um, how, yeah, you're, you're changing as you're, as you're drawing in his energy even closer and really like living and breathing these teachings because it is so important. Like I could not do this job if I was not being, um, just, uh, you know, embracing or like steeped in his teachings every moment of every day, because, um, these are not popular positions to be in. I have people every day who disagree with the way that I'm running the Institute or what I'm doing or how I did this, or, you know, this person has some feels or whatever. And if I'm not doing the teachings and I'm or the practices and really steeping myself in the teachings, I'm getting just like wild, like thrown around all over the place with all of these opinions and ideas and feelings. And instead, I have to just like stay really focused on him, the teachings of integral yoga, what my purpose is here. I always say to people, I don't work for the board. I don't work for the Institute. I don't work for anyone. I just work for Sri Gurudev. That's it. And as long as I'm being of use here and serving Sri Gurudev's name, Great. If the board decides, uh, no, not anymore, then I go serve Sri Great Evan some other way. But I've spent my whole life serving him in one way or another, and I will continue to do so in any capacity that is available to me. So it's a joy to get to serve in this place, though, because I do love this institute and I love integral yoga. It's my whole life. Hmm. I want to go back to, to childhood a little bit because I think <laughs> okay. it's, so, it's so fascinating. <laughs> what it means to grow up, you know, going to a yogic school. Yeah. I'm curious if like you notice just any general differences between maybe yourself and just, you know, the regular public that went through more of a traditional school and especially like being in New York city, there's so many people around, like, is there anything like come comes to mind to you when you see other people's behavior and you're just like, huh, like maybe that would have been me if I would have gone to a traditional school or something like that. Just, yeah. Kind of any big, like just takeaways from directly from your education. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's funny you say that. Cause I don't actually think that thoughts ever crossed my mind before. Um, I think, I think it's never occurred to me that I would not be raised in, in integral yoga or in, in this path. So it's not something I even think about. Right. Um, but what I do know is that you can't start meditating at six years old and not have it be powerful. Right. And my mind is very powerful. Anyone who knows me knows I'm very powerful, right? If I set my mind to something, things happen. And sometimes it feels a little overwhelming to the people around me because there's such like a one pointed focus that I can create. Um, but you know, that's not, that's not no small thing. And you'll notice this of course, with being a dad, and raising children in yoga, like meditate with your kids. Kids are such good meditators. Like it's so much easier to meditate as a kid than it is as an adult. So much easier. Like now my mind is so much chattier than it was when I was six, right? Mm -hmm. Six, I just sit down and I'd be like, okay, I'm meditating. Oh, <laughs> now I'm like, oh my gosh. Now I'm like, oh, what should I do for dinner? Like got to clear that? all that why, stuff out. Right? Why is that the case? 
Well, I think because kids are still like really in their natural state, right? Like we kind of haven't messed with them too much yet. Um, if you believe in these teachings, like, right, we, we are these divine beings. And so we come into the world as these divine beings. And that's why when you look in a baby's eyes, like people just look at babies and are mesmerized, right? Because I think they're still like, they're still um, not quite grounded in the human humanness yet, right? They're still these spiritual beings that are just sort of embodied in these little bodies, right? And as kids grow up, you know, we start to be indoctrinated by society. We start being told all these things. Now, as kids growing up in Yogaville, we definitely like, there was a lot of openness and a lot of ability to express ourselves however we wanted to express ourselves. Um, the flip side of that, there was also very high expectations of us. We were, you know, our teachers, Satya and Sadashiva were our teachers when we were young. And then Sarvananda, Lakshmi Barsal, uh, Kumari Dasashi. Um, but particularly when we were young, Satya and Sadashiva were always like, you are great spiritual beings. Like you must have, you know, they, they always tell this story of like, you know, in order to uh, have been born to spiritual parents, you had to have done lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes of sadhana and yogic practice. So you think of somebody like Zen, like what Zen had to do to get to be born into a human form with spiritual parents. So the, our teachers were always like, you know, really reminded us, like, you are spiritual beings. You're in little bodies right now, but you're spiritual beings. And so nothing is impossible. You can do whatever you want. But also we were held to like this incredible standard of, um, you know, we weren't treated like little kids, like, oh, they're little kids, they're messy. Or, oh, they're little kids, they can't do that. It was very much like, no, you're children, but you're also, you know, we would scrub the little bathrooms, like our bathrooms in our school, the kids would do all the chores every day. That school was so immaculate, you can't even imagine. Like we all had our chores and if we didn't do it right, there was no failing in Vidyalium, right? If you didn't clean the bathroom right, you go back and clean it again. If you didn't get a good grade on your test, you don't just get to pass it on. No, you go back and you learn the information until you learn it. And so I think like having those foundations, of course, um, creates a situation where we would stand out. And I do think that's part of the reason why we do have a little bit of a, a kind of like a weird skewed number of us who have gone on to either um, to do some pretty amazing things in our field. Right. So, you know, whether that is as musicians or actors or, you know, designers of video games or city planners or whatever that is that we went off to do. Um, we have just had a lot of success in our field. And so when you look at like the number of kids that went through the Vidalium or the yoga schools, and then you kind of consider how many of them have gone on to have extreme success in their areas of expertise, it's, it's a little skewed. It's kind of crazy when you look at the numbers. And I think that's part of it is because of the way that we were raised. Now, the flip side of that is, um, as an adult, that perfectionism kind of sort of backfired a little bit, right? And so many of us have got really hard on ourselves, myself included, where I kind of like had to go back almost to like Sri Gurudev's like clear teachings and to clear some of that away. Because of course, there were interpretations that I created as a five-year-old or a six-year-old or a seven-year-old about being perfect and wanting to have that like praise of my teachers and all of that experience. And then later on, like being, you know, 30 years old and trying to be perfect for my boss at work or whatever that, you know, translated as. So again, when I go back to the teachings and the words of Sri Gurudev, I get clarity on all of that. But sometimes, you know, um, as with anything and as with any organization, when you're talking about other people interpreting, interpreting teachings or interpreting the messaging, um, there's always going to be a little bit of, of confusion that happens. So as kids, I would say, like, sometimes those interpretations affected us a little bit heavier than they maybe even affected the adults. And there was a lot of um, we were so experimental, Avi, so experimental, like they didn't know what they were doing. They had ideas. They had a vision. They had some like ideas like this could work, but we were so experimental. And for the most part, I would say that experiment was a wild success. 
Um, but definitely there's some, there is some stuff that, uh, also we see within the kids that we raise that are some kind of like, again, the perfectionism and the guilt is like kind of a big one. Like somehow we ended up with like some, some weird Catholic guilt stuff. I'm not sure where that came from. (laughs) (laughs) Us and the Catholics. (laughs) You mentioned feeling that you were like doing something important in the world when you were growing up, like this feeling that you had, like that what you yeah. were a part of was like really important. Yeah. When I read like Heaven on Earth, I, I get that feeling too. Like Sri Gurudev's vision of Yogaville is like an example for how human beings can live together in community, you know? Um, and you know, I'm curious if you have any uh, any take on just how important it is to feel that way in life. And could all you, you know, is it possible for all humans to like feel that their life is that important that like what I'm a part of what I'm doing is, is important. Is that like a skewed yeah. type of no, thing? No, I don't maybe think it, so. Yeah. I don't think so. So, you know, uh, I've spent the better part of the last year studying with a leadership, a transformational leadership company. And I do some work on the side with them as well. And I've coached with them. Um, uh, hardcore leadership. They're a really amazing company. And one of the things that I really love about working with hardcore is it's giving me a little bit of perspective too. So, um, so one of the things that they encourage us to do, like the very first step that we go through in the training is vision. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're getting us engaged in this vision, right? As being leaders of this world, we get to have a big vision. We get to wake up every morning and be lit up by our purpose on this planet. Like, you know, none of us were just put here to, you know, uh, eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner and go to sleep at night. Like human form is so precious. And our time on this planet is so rich and so full of so many delights and so many amazing things. And we were put here to enjoy all of that, right. And to experience all of that. So I love the leadership because it kind of like reminds me of that experience when we were young. And also what's super cool is like, as leaders, we invoke that in other people, right? So, you know, one of the things that people say when they're talking to me lately is they're like, Ooh, Radha, I get really excited. I'm sure you've experienced it recently. Abby. I get really excited when I'm talking to you because you're so lit up, right? I'm like, integral yoga is the best path on the whole planet. We need to tell everybody it's the greatest. <laughs> right? So, you know, when you're really lit up about something, you're bringing that to everyone around you. And one of the things that's also been a delight about studying leadership is seeing how Sri Gurudev was the most amazing leader in the entire world. All the skills, all the things that I've been learning over the last year, when I contrast them against what he was doing and how he was interacting with us and what he was creating and everything he was doing just makes me like that much more in awe of him. Cause I'm like, he was a very powerful leader. He had this incredible vision that not only did he enroll people in, in the sixties, But here we are in 2022 and you and I are still sitting here talking about his incredible vision for this planet and what we could create and how we can be a part of this. Right. And when we read heaven on earth, it resonates because it's resonating with something also in ourselves. That's so amazing. So, you know, I think, I just, I think it is part of, I think we get told these stories of like, you know, life should be hard. Don't set your expectations too high. You know, we can't, do amazing things in the world. We should be practical, all of these things. And that's not what Sri told us. He was like, no, you can be enlightened. You can be God realized. You can create a heaven on earth. And this is how we're going to do it. And all we got to do is just listen, just listen. Right. And so, um, yeah, so I get lit up. (laughs) I'm excited. What what do you mean? Just listen. (laughs) Well, just listen to his teachings, right? Just listen Mm. to the way that he guided us to do it. Now, maybe integral yoga or this heaven on earth isn't your path, but then find a path, find something that is lighting you up and gets you excited in the morning. And for some people that might be, um, you know, I don't know. For some people, it's like holding babies in a hospital or some people it's saving dogs or whatever it is. But I do feel like with integral yoga, we've been given a huge gift from Sri Gurita because 
we've been giving these teachings that are interpreted the way that he's interpreted these 5,000 year old teachings or 10,000 or however old you want to say that they are. Um, and he's given us to them in a really practical way that we can follow this path and we can follow the steps he set forward. And we can have all this, like we can wake up with joy. We can be joyful people, you know, and I'm not trying to like knock anybody in the path because everybody's on their own path and everybody has their own experience. But I literally had somebody walk up to me and she went on the hall one day and be like, why are you so happy? Like, why are you always smiling? I'm like, cause I do yoga. <laughs> 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 that's why if people are wondering why she's so giddy all the time well because i follow the teachings i don't know because sugar enough told us that's that's who we are right that i mean, I'm, to me, I'm, that's that's what that's what it's all about i mean that's that's <laughs> that's how i want to feel that this life is a gift that i wake up that wow i get yeah. another day that, to me that's where yeah. the teachings lead and that's why i go there yeah. And for me, when I'm talking about the teachings and I'm talking about Sri Gurida, when I'm doing this work of bringing his message out into the world, um, that's how I feel when I'm in that space. When I'm not doing that work is usually when I get depressed, anxious, all of those things. Mm-hmm. When I'm feeling like I'm in alignment with his message and, um, and again, sharing his teachings out there in the world, that's where I feel the most joy and where I really, you know, I light up. And that's, I think, what my husband's seen in me. Right. Since I've been more engaged because he's never seen me in the position where I was working directly with integral yoga or yogaville or something like that. So, um, yeah, I think like I just get to accept that that's the truth for my life at the very least. But I'm always going to be happiest when I'm bringing these teachings out into the world and sharing Sri Gurudev's teachings and and again, embodying his presence and his joy in any way that I can. Rada, thank you so much for your time and everything that you're doing. It's a total pleasure thank to know you. you. Oh, thank you, Abby. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this content and think others might as well, please feel free to share and subscribe.